Hello and welcome to the Yellow Chair Collective. We are a psychotherapy practice based in Los Angeles. I am Jack Lamb, and I use they, them, and he, him pronouns. And I am an outreach coordinator and psychotherapist here at Yellow Chair Collective. So in conjunction with National Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month, we here at YCC thought we'd have a light chat about Latinx and Asian cultures. We wanted to discuss our upbringing and cultures from a mental health perspective, being in communities that are underserved in this field and have a heavier stigma against mental illnesses and psychotherapy in general. So I'm really stoked about this interview today that I'll be facilitating. And just to give y'all some background on me as well, I am a Malaysian Chinese immigrant and most of my therapeutic experience has been working with LGBTQ plus POC adolescents and young adults. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Garcia and I go by the pronouns she and her. I grew up in a Mexican household and I'm currently a supervisor and psychotherapist with the Yellow Chair Collective. I have eight years of experience working with adolescents and the Tay population that fall under the Latinx community. Hi, I'm Daisy Jessic. My pronouns are she, her. I am a psychotherapist at Yellow Chair Collective. I honestly primarily work with Latinx and Asian communities um, from all ages, but typically adolescents and young adults. Hi, everyone. My name is Angelica Sun. I'm a psychotherapist at Yellow Chair Collective, too. Um, I am a Chinese, and I'm currently in an international marriage with my partner, who's half uh, Mexican. So I currently work with individual couples and families from all cultural background. Um, but for about like three to four years, I mostly work with children and teenagers uh, from Hispanic and Asian families. So this has been something that I'm very interested um, on a personal level, but also in a like in my professional, like as a therapist, it comes up a lot. So I'm really happy and excited to be here. I think it's going to be a really fun conversation to have. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Connie. I use she, they pronouns and I'm a second generation Korean American and I have my, I grew up with immigrant parents speaking Korean mainly in the household. I work with a lot of POC clients, particularly worked with children in South LA as well as older adults around like ages 30 to 65. So I've served a lot of um, South LA communities and they primarily tend to be African-American and um, Latino. So I wanna get started uh, with kind of just a general idea, right? So what do you think of when you think of mental health for your community? I think something that's come up for the communities that I tend to work with is that stigma of mental health is, is for someone who's crazy or, you know, we don't talk about our problems outside of the home. And there's, there's just this level of everything's okay, even if it's not. How is it okay? It's just, it's just okay. We're fine. Everything is fine. And going off from that, that's just also like how prevalent it is, like because everybody's not talking about it, but it's like in terms of I'm thinking about trauma, like racial trauma, intergenerational trauma, violence, all of that happening on a daily basis, but nobody's talking about it. And it creates a lot of conversation that should have been had. And also mental health is is a big issue, even though we're not talking about it, or maybe it's not being accepted to talk about it. Um, I know that in my family, like talking about feelings, it's like, what is that? Like, how do you even do that? Seeing my clients go through very um, similar issues, a little bit of it has been eye-opening, a little bit of it has also been like, is this more of a generational thing that we need to change in newer to newer generations? So I'm when I start wondering if everyone else goes through this, not just because it's based on a racial uh, community or a racial group. A lot of shame has also been normalized because of the stigma of not wanting or not even not wanting but not knowing not having the language on how to talk about this with our family members and our community yeah you know what i totally agree with that i grew up in a household where 
you would talk to my dad, he'd be like, oh, you know, those problems never existed in Mexico. Depression, I don't even think there's a word for that. He's like, that's so weird how in America people really struggle with that. You know, he'll say, if you have problems, talk to me. You don't need to see a therapist. So I feel like that's a pretty common experience in immigrant communities, right? Where we're just kind of like, oh, all the problems, like stay in the house. Don't like air your dirty laundry. If you need help, talk to your family. That's what we're there for. I was just having a conversation the other day with some um, Oklahoma Nation friends and I told them that I was a therapist and they were like, oh, that's really hard because you need a lot of like hand muscles for that, right? Like you have to press really hard. And I was like, no, no, like, like a psychotherapist. And they just looked at me and they're like, so <laughs> what, what, I <laughs> genuinely like did not understand like what that is. <laughs> that's the kind of community culture I come from. Right, the myth of being a therapist, the myth of going to therapy, what it means. Like, so you are a therapist. Do you know what I'm thinking right now? Is that what you do? You know, what's funny, just going off of what Jack was saying, um, I've gone to a few countries in Central America and there they'll ask you when you go through customs, what do you do? And I've said therapist in Spanish and they're looking at me kind of in a sense of, I don't, I don't know what that is. Like a doctor? No, I'm not a doctor. And it's, it's very interesting where we've just learned that they know what social worker is. So I will just say I'm a social worker and it's an automatic, like nasty taste in your mouth. Like, oh, you're one of those. Okay. But when it comes to therapists, they looked at me in a sense, I don't know what to put down on your documents because that's not a real thing here. But it's very fascinating just in different cultures where it's not considered kind of like a real job in a sense, because again, how Daisy was saying, and I've experienced that, my mom has said that there's a lot of challenges with youth nowadays. Like, I don't remember this. Well, that's because they, you guys aren't talking about it, mom. It's not that it didn't exist. It's, it's more, there's a level of acceptance. There's still taboo with it, but there's a better understanding and appreciation for mental health. Now there's still a lot of work that needs to be done but I do appreciate the progress that we've made. Yeah, I think about the, the kind of traumas that like my parents and grandparents go through and they, I don't know, minimize maybe that they don't you know, talk about or they don't maybe understand or see the point in talking about. I remember one time, this was just recently too, that my mom was like, oh yeah, you know, when your grandma was growing up, actually she woke up to like Japanese bombs, you know, in the village and they would just hide under the tables. And I'm like, I, never knew about this <laughs> and she was like oh yeah it's just that's just how everyone here grew up and just like the casualness of like bringing that up like oh yeah sure that that happened and when I used to work with like Hispanic family a lot of things I noticed is also like emotional abuse happened with kids and teens like the yelling screaming name calling like that was also being normalized a lot as you know this is just how everybody experiences it like you know you need to tough it up like because nobody else complain about it and i see that very often with my own family too where like similar to jack's experience that everybody goes through this why are you complaining nobody else is causing troubles right that it's going back to the taboo to the stigma to the labeling of people who do talk about it get labeled as you know weak weak or get labeled as there's something wrong with you. Like you're not being, you're not playing your part of the family. You're not being strong enough to support everybody else. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, Angelica, because I think, yeah, when you start labeling people as weak and being vulnerable and, you know, crying is like not acceptable at all, it really does create this culture of shame. And, you know, shame just keeps coming back to me, at least. What's really interesting about our field is that therapists, People seek us out when they want change and the status quo, right? And whatever their dynamic with the family is, whatever they're dealing, what kind of relationship isn't quite working out, maybe with their parents or their spouse or whatever. I think that's another reason why like our field is just so like, like what? Like, like, I don't understand like what you do. You disrupt my family? Like what, like what, what are you doing? It's like, how dare you? It's like everything's been working fine, especially because of all the normalizing of like, yeah, bombs, whatever. Like, what's the big deal, you know? And waking up to people screaming and okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to resonate with that. Have y'all ever had that experience where, Connie, you were saying, you know, you're making recommendations or you're suggesting changes for a system and they're like, that's not what we do. 
I think working with youth and when you're suggesting that to a parent, it's an automatic defense that comes up. Well, do you have kids and how were you raised? And you know, what's your experience and you don't live in my home, which is very interesting because ultimately it's not to say that I'm here to judge one's family or to tell someone what to do. It's more so I have that book knowledge and you have the personal experience knowledge and together we're a team and we're here to figure out what is best for your family, obviously what's happening right now is not working. So we need to shift gears and look, you know, go down other avenues, but I have, I get that all the time. I think I was really lucky <laughs> to not have experienced that. I was actually really scared for that to come up. We're really like walking on a fine line between how do I help guide you so that you don't keep traumatizing your children and then also, yeah, you also grew up with this norm of how you were raised. And we're not necessarily always saying that it's everything you did was wrong. Let's try to pick the things that we want to keep and then pick the things that we want to change and try to make that into the norm and the culture. Yeah, you know what? I feel like that's a good point. I remember one of the challenges that I really faced was like, really interpreting certain terminology so that they would understand. Um, I remember creating like a treatment plan and going over it with the family and there. And I would ask them questions. They'd be like, what's that word? And I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, I don't know how else to say this. I would need to describe that certain word. And I remember I would come home and I'd be like calling my mom or my dad. Hey, so is this the right word to use for this word? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, how come they didn't understand me? And they're like, well, it just depends. You know, like sometimes there's different terminology that you would use between like people who are from different countries and, you know, we're Mexican. And so I'm like, oh, you know what? That's a really good point. But just having that like language barrier still, even though we speak the same language there are differences between like Mexican people Guatemalans I don't know South Americans there's like little differences where the language is even different and going off from that like what the context comes with the language right the language brings a certain kind of like if it's a label you've been used or the culture has been used to to really stigmatize something like now they're like I've heard it so many times from like a lot of people like not only from like Asian community Hispanic community from a lot of community they like when I was doing the the trauma screening and they would tell me Mm, I wouldn't necessarily call it a trauma. It was just like a little upsetting, right? But like later on, we dig deeper into it. It was totally trauma, but they somehow just cannot connect this word with their experience because for them, this word means something way worse than what it is. And it, it, on a certain level, I feel like on a cognitive level or psychologically level speaking, like that really disconnect them from feeling how much it hurts right? It, it, it can really be a block on the way to really to heal, to really look at that wound and say, let's heal. Right. I think um, something that I've also realized a lot of the families that I've worked with are immigrant families and just their educational attainment is very limited and it's not their fault. I've learned to use the terminology that the family uses as opposed to using the course that that they made us take that had to do with mental health terminology. Majority of my families aren't aware of that. They don't use those words. They're very prime and proper. And it's more so kind of going into a situation and really feeling out the family and seeing what they use. All right, that's what we're gonna use. They use certain words. Um, for instance, like therapista is not a word. It's not correct for a therapist. Majority of families will use that and I've got I've been dinged on that so many times just within professionals where they'll, they'll correct me and they'll let me know, but I will tell them that's what my family uses. So therefore I'm going to use the terminology that the family uses because if I were to use the, the correct term, they look at me, I have no idea what that is. I've had to describe things because there's no way that I either didn't remember the term or they didn't understand the term. So it was more of a game in a sense. Okay, let's figure out. How do I describe this to the family to really meet their needs? Yeah, Lauren, I'm really glad you brought that up because I was just thinking about how the word trauma is actually still fairly new, especially in the psychotherapy realm, right? I was trying to describe it to my mom maybe a month or two ago, and I'm like, like, trauma, you know, like she's just giving me this, she's like, what? So then I had to use uh, the metaphor of physical trauma, right? You know, when you're like, when you get hurt, like really bad, 
and like you need to like treat it <laughs> yeah and she's like yeah you know and I'm like yeah so that happens with feelings too and she's like what like she was just really clueless like it's just it's it's definitely new and I'm gonna go back to the whole generational maybe language that is being introduced and the older generations as well they're kind of having a harder time like understanding and it's a newer concept and so I think to constantly normalize like crying is okay and you're you have trauma like you're hurt, you know, in here and maybe in here. And we talk about it. We talk about it and we try to see what's going on and what we could do to help. That's a taboo itself. It's like, no, we don't talk about it like at all, you know? It's true. And I think I will name to, at least in my experience, I know a lot of what I know about mental illnesses comes from the DSM. And that's like a Western, the symptoms of the mental illnesses are described and formulated by, well, historically white men in this country. So, you know, there are certain things I, I've noticed that like when uh, my family or people in my community like describe, um, they wouldn't necessarily describe it in terms of like thoughts and feelings. They wouldn't describe it more as body sensations and physical symptoms, right? So instead of saying like, oh, I'm really stressed, they would say, you know, I just feel like really tense. You know, I just feel like my body's really tense or I just feel really tired. I feel really cranky. You know, I'm not, I, I wouldn't say I'm anxious. You know, I'm not anxious, I'm not stressed. I, I think that's super interesting too because then we're supposed to take what we've learned with the DSM and then kind of like almost translate, right? Or almost like find a new way and find better understandings of it to kind of relate to you know, what our clients are going through, like what Lauren's saying, you know, we're molding to their understanding because they know, like they, they can feel it in their bodies and it exists for them. They just don't know how to name it or label it. Um, and we're supposed to bridge that with the, the models, I guess, that we've learned. <laughs> I'm wondering if y'all noticed like any similarities between like Latinx and Asian families that you've worked with? I definitely have noticed a lot of similarities between Latinx and Asian families that I've worked with for sure. I feel like the number one thing that I've heard people tell me is about their family. Um, I have a lot of like Asian clients where they're like children of immigrants and they'll tell me their story. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like, are we living the same life? Like, you know, I'm like, those experiences are so similar to mine or how my parents were like way back when, or how my grandma, grandpa is. And I think one of the things for us is the uh, family values and stuff like that, like putting family first, you know, like I said earlier, not really saying anything outside of like your household. But I think also one of the major things is how we talk about things, right? Like how you guys were saying, like there's not really a language that's describing like physical symptoms. And I can almost see on the screen as I'm talking to them, how empowering it is for them to realize that okay, this is like not okay what happened to me, no matter how many people are telling me that just keep within the family, don't say anything. And then I've noticed that when my clients start to cry, whether they're Asian or Latinx, they'll say like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so embarrassed, I'm sorry for crying. And I'm like, no, it's okay. And they're like, really? And one of the common things they'll tell me is, well, my parents used to always tell me, don't cry or I'll give you a reason to cry. And I'm like, wow, you know, this is a safe space, right? And then they'll cry even more and they're like, thank you. But I see that both in both communities for sure. Yeah, I wanted to mention the patriarchal systems that are quite parallel in a lot of Asian and, and Hispanic cultures. I think machismo is the, right, like the Spanish word, right, for promoting like masculinity in ways that are not always healthy. <laughs> And I see a lot of like that stoicism and like only anger is like the pretty much the only exception to showing your emotions. So if you're scared, you're angry. <laughs> you lash out at people. If you're annoyed, you're angry. If you're sad, you're angry. Like a lot of the time men tend to default into anger because that's been socially acceptable. But if crying and actually feeling the sadness and like sitting with that, they're just like, no, what is this? You know, like this is alien. And, and it's also been so discouraged in both cultures. No, you cannot, th this is unacceptable. 
I mean, they do that, I think, for females as well. I, I grew up with that. You know, my dad, or even my mom, really, they would always tell me, like, to stop crying, you know? And it's been a cultural thing to just it default say that, stop crying. When you see someone is crying, stop crying. In terms of patriarchy of the family, men tend to be what the breadwinners, as well as the ones who call the shots and make the decisions a lot of the time. And women have had to, um, I guess, abide um, to submit a lot of the time. Um, I know I definitely see that, I saw that in my family a lot. And uh, my dad was the one who was like, work, like he ends up making all the decisions and then the family just has to go with it. And I've also seen like the, um, like the ages, like hierarchy of like, you definitely have to respect your elders. There's a hierarchy of an authority figure that you have to follow and not question. I can absolutely relate to what you're saying, Connie. I, I grew up with a very liberal mom. And she was raised that way by my grandfather in a sense of no one dictates your household and you don't depend on anybody. But my dad grew up with a very machista type of point of view. Uh, my grandfather is still that way. He's pushing 90. So it's funny now because he's just like this grumpy old man. But it caused a lot of conflict in my home growing up because my dad would say one thing. And if my mother didn't, if it didn't align with her values, there was a lot of conflict and I grew up with that same mindset. So for the longest time growing up as a child, my dad and I would go at it and he would tell my mom in unflattering terms, but ultimately your daughter is just like you. But it didn't sound like that. It was very hurtful the way it was described. And it was more so because my mom just raised us. If you see something and something isn't right, you need to say something. Even if it's not you, you need to stand up for that person and you don't sit back and you're never quiet. And for my dad, it was essentially like you belong in the kitchen type of situation. He would never say it that way, but it was a look of who are you talking to? And why are you saying that? Because nobody in on his side of the family, no one is that way. I look at my mom's side and she's the only one out of nine siblings that you don't control me. You don't dictate me. You don't tell me what to do. And she's essentially seen as you know, the black sheep of the family. I see that with a lot of the families I work with where it's, well, let me ask my husband, but he doesn't participate in therapy. So how is he dictating what happens in therapy when you're the parent I'm working with, with your child? And it, it's very interesting to, to really see how strongly and deep rooted these gender norms are still till this day. And it is, I, I see when I have boys crying and you can see like, they'll have to just really just, it's fine, I'm fine. You know, I, I realize I'm vulnerable. Let me just pull that back. And okay, so what were you saying? It's really unfortunate to see that. I, I get it. But at the same time, I also don't know it firsthand because my mom just absolutely eliminated that type of mindset. And the same thing with my brother, you don't ever downplay a woman's opinion and your partner and any of that. You need to hear them out. You all are equals. And this is your relationship. This isn't, I'm above you. I, I feel like this is one of those moments it's like I got triggered <laughs> like I can relate to so many of it I already feel my anger rising because of my personal experience like I heard this so often we're coming from my clients who talks about I can never make them hear me right like because of that norms like I can like they won't understand like no matter how hard I try because of that block stare, because you're a woman, because you are my child. So it doesn't matter what you said. Your opinion is never as le legit as mine. And I see it definitely with the, 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 the gender norms and also with the, the parent-child like hierarchy so often, even with my adult client who are just so upset about that dynamic with their adult parents, but they're not being perceived as an individual, as an adult because of like, Part, the other side of it is the family values, right? It's it's part of your group, part of your community. This is your role. Like I feel like in both culture, we are often seen as just the role we are to other people because it's a very community based. There's this this group identity there instead of being seen as an individual in the family, like an individual who can speak her or his mind right? Have an individual identity. It's always, I'm somebody's child. I'm somebody's husband. I am somebody's mom. 
instead of I'm just who I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering like how collectivistic Latinx cultures tend to be. Yeah, that's something that I'm curious about because I, I guess the way that I see it in my family is you do not disrupt the family dynamic. And even if you're suffering, if you care about the group more. So if you're not happy, like you got to suck it up, make sure that you keep harmony in the family. It doesn't have to be that extreme. It's more about like you're thinking about the group's overall well-being rather than how am I feeling and how am I doing? Like that isn't prioritized. When I think of that, I think of with my family and some of a lot of my Asian friends' families, it's like when you do something and then you ask yourself like, oh, actually, I, I, I don't think I'm going to do that. And when you ask why, they're like, oh, it's just because, you know, in the back of my head or I can already hear my mom saying like, what will your, what will your aunt think? What will your uncle think? What will this person think? And it's just like, oh, they're, they're not even here. <laughs> why did they get a say? <laughs> I agree. Similar to what Jack was saying, I think because of the field that I'm in, there is so much learning that we're constantly doing and this field is constantly changing. And when that comment happens all the time, what are your tias going to say or what are your tios? They're not my parents. You know, and I'm able to provide an explanation of why I'm feeling a certain way. And I still get the looks, like I get the caras from my mom or she'll do the eyes. Right. And I'm like, you know, and I look at her back in a sense of, no, this is not okay. And this, I've realized that my cousins and then the new babies that are coming in, they're shaking things up and it's not necessarily a bad thing. I know it is for the, you know, the older ones, they're a little like, what? I'm very mindful because I can get loud really fast and I can get, I can, it can be interpreted as being rude and things of that nature. So I'm very mindful of my body language and my tone, but I'm still going to say what I'm going to say. And again, it's not to be disrespectful. It's more so, but everybody thought that I just was the one, I guess, if you want to say, had the courage to say it and it's breaking certain cycles that I see happen. It can be very disrespectful, the situation, but they're not going to say anything. We're just going to let it go to have a kumbaya and have our family be okay. But you can feel the tension. You can feel that people are not okay, but no one wants to take that first stance on it and say something. So then there's me. I'm like, I'll say it. Like, let's just, you know, have a debate. Let's talk about this. It usually does not end well, but I tell my mom, this is not okay. I'm not okay with this. So we need to start changing things because this is very unhealthy or I'm just gonna continue distancing myself on certain things because it's an healthy situation. And I teach the younger ones, if you feel something internally that there's a reason for it and we need to talk about it, we don't hold that in. But then their moms also look at me and I'm telling them, no, we're building healthy little people. I resonate with that. And I think it's just so, sometimes it's so like deep set into family cultures. Like I know for sure in my family, like we will never fight like at any family gathering. There will never be like an outward fight. There might be like tension and there might be like passive aggressiveness, but that's as far as it goes. And then the fight will happen after in the WhatsApp groups where they'll all like start attacking each other, but like behind their backs, right? Like you're, you're talking to another aunt about this other aunt. And it was like, oh, did you hear or did you see what she did? Like, wasn't that so disrespectful at your house? <laughs> and it will circulate like it, people who weren't even at the party will know about it <laughs> and it's just and then we're, we're, we all just sit with the knowledge it's like oh that aunt is, did something rude but we're, nobody's gonna tell her nobody's gonna address it we're, we're just gonna harbor a secret resentment towards her like from now on I kind of wanted to bring up children of immigrants parents I feel like that's a whole other world that not very many people talk about. And I think a lot of Latinx cultures as well as Asian, um, Asian communities, they have a lot of overlap where children who are born here or they're more fluent in English, they kind of have to grow up a little bit faster than for, you know, having grown up with parents who speak the same language as them. And so a lot of interpreting, a lot of translating, going to the doctors, translating things for them, translating mail, like all of that. I think is definitely something that I've seen in my personal life. I've had to interpret a lot for my parents. Yeah, I think that touches on, was it Lauren, you said earlier that sometimes there is a generational difference, right? And I think a lot of it also comes from the fact that, you know, growing up in America is a hugely different experience. Just being here, even as an immigrant, I noticed that, you know, I, I, I take in a lot of like individualistic ideas. And of course, some of them are, I guess, healthier in a sense for 
self-identity, but a lot of them also don't jive with collectivist ideas that we have much stronger notions of back home. There's often like communication blockages there, but I, I can only imagine like what it's like growing up here for, <laughs> for all of your life and having your parents be immigrant parents as well. Yeah, like yeah. growing up worlds. Sorry, that's it. <laughs> no, go ahead, Connie. I just say, yeah, like growing up in two different worlds and having to navigate that, the cultural barriers, language barriers, and like that make having this dance um, between your family and um, you, you know, especially if like you grew up here and they're just like, I don't understand American culture. Yeah, like my parents thought like toothpaste was like edible, like you could like eat it. So they, <laughs> when they first came here. So yeah, like it's like little things like that or like, I think it was more Western in, in, in terms of like birthday cakes and like candles and like, I don't know, I guess they didn't do that back in Korea, but back in their time. Um, and so it's like a fairly new thing. They're like, oh, they like they do, Americans do weird things. <laughs> they tell me. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was thinking when you both were talking, Connie and Jack, about like my own experience, because my parents are both immigrants from Mexico. And I was like, hmm, how would my experience differ maybe from those who have like multiple generations in America or like both parents and child are from another country? And I think it, it is quite different. Sometimes I have like language barriers between me and my parents, which is kind of weird to say, but they'll talk to me and I'm like, what? I'm like, what was that word that you used? Or I just don't understand. Or I'll talk to them and they don't understand me, particularly with my mom. We get very frustrated at each other. And I'm just like, I don't understand what you're saying. She's like, well, I don't understand what you're saying. And we just like walk off. I'm just like, okay, well, we'll come back later when we both have a little bit more patience with one another. But I do remember, I think quite recently, um, my mom was talking to me and she's very passionate when she talks, you know? And so I was like, why are you mad right now? And she was like, I'm not, that's how I talk. And I was like, oh, well, the tone comes off like really mad. And she's like, no. And I'm like, well, because when you talk normally, she's very quiet and reserved. And when she's passionate about something, it comes off kind of like really expressive and passionate for her. But for me, because I'm not used to like people speaking in Spanish super passionately, I come, I become like Ooh, a little scared. I'm like, mom, are you mad at me? And she's like, no, I'm just expressing myself. And I think that's one of the biggest things. And Connie, what you were saying earlier with like translating and interpreting I think that still happens this day my mom will show me an email and she'll be like so can you reply to this person and say that I don't know your little brother is interested in joining soccer and I was like oh okay yeah you do it and my mom's like what I'm not doing it I'm like no mom I'm like we have to like you know I'm not always going to be around or not everybody's going to be available and she'll get mad I'm like I'll be right behind you on the computer if you need help and so she'll type it out and she's like, okay, what does this look like? I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds great. And I'm like, okay, see this little button right here? That's where you hit send. And so little by little, I've been teaching, like, I guess both of my parents to be a little bit more independent. And I will say that Siri is a godsend. My dad will not text anymore. He'll be talking. He's like, hi, so I'm on my way to work. Da, da, da. And it'll type it all out. And then he'll hit send. He's like, wow, this is amazing. I don't have to really like put in all the work to type everything out. And so I think that's where my experience does differ. I love, Daisy, that you said that because you made me really think about my experience because technically I am in that position where like I'm technically an immigrant. So I just started to remember like relating to some of the parents that I work with. The first thing when I noticed when I came here to the U.S. is how hard it is to live my everyday life. Like small things really pisses me off. Like I read slower in English than in Chinese. It's just slower, it's not, and it's actually not that slow, but it pisses me off so much. It makes me really angry because usually I just need like a little bit of energy to do the small things, but now I need to put the majority of my time trying to figure out stuff. So I think one of the biggest difference I rec recognize is the level of safety. How safe do I feel here? And I remember almost having a panic attack because I don't know what's the right social norm to talk to my neighbors. And I, I almost had a panic attack just over very small things like that because my neighbor invited me to go for dinner. And I was like, what do I do? What do I bring? What do I wear? What do I say? And every small thing really triggers this big feeling of I am not safe. I don't know how to be, right? Even though I speak the language, even though I understand a lot of the, about the, the, the Western culture norm already, 
and I can only imagine like our parents, like other generations coming here, not speaking the language and having feeling that sense of how safe do I feel? Like even to this day, if I go to see a doctor or something, like if I have to fix my car, I grab my husband with me because I'm so afraid that they're going to say something I don't understand. I, and they talk so fast and I don't even know how to catch up, how to ask about that. And also because I speak the language on a certain level. So they're going to assume I understand everything they say. Right. So even small things like that still triggers me to feel like I'm not safe here. I'm not safe here. And I imagine that being with like if I have a kid, if there's a kids of the immigrants family, that level of safety they're bringing to their parents. Uh, I mean, in a way, it's a support, but also like it's going to make the parents very like Stacy, what you're talking about, they're going to be very depending on the kid. And it's not just a skilled level, it's psychologically also like a mental level. How safe do I feel here? I don't know anything about this world. Oh, I'm like so glad you brought that up, Angelica. Like, I'm like seeing my parents in a different light right now. <laughs> I'm like, oh, they've been scared this whole time, you know? It's just such an unfair situation for both parties. Because I'm second generation, I've had to interpret a lot. And especially like when my dad was really sick, he was like terminally ill and he was in and out of uh, the ER. A lot of the time there's interpretation services in uh, hospitals. However, because I'm such easy access, even the physicians come to me and I'm like, I would much prefer that you use an interpreter because I don't know medical jargon in Korean, but then they're like, oh, but then like, can you just answer these few more questions? Can you just like, so is, how often is your dad coughing? Or like, you know, it's like really frustrating for me because even that, not just my parents, but like the people on the outside, because of the way I look, because I'm the children of immigrant parents, they just assume that I have the language. And I'm like, that's a huge burden to carry as, as um, children of immigrant parents. You know what, Connie, I was just thinking about what it's like to be the first person to hear that news, whatever it might be, and having to process it first without that emotional support of your parents, and then having to think about how do I say this to my parents? Because I remember being in that situation, and I do think that it is a big burden of like needing to grow up faster than maybe your peers, right, about hearing that news first. Yeah, thank you for saying that, DZ. Um, it's hard. I have to like dissociate actually and just be like, okay, facts, facts, facts. And then I go home and cry <laughs> because it's so overwhelming. Something that you brought up, Connie, I had a client who her father passed away and the doctors told her first and she had to relay that message to her mom. And it was horrible hearing this, you know, working through her trauma and this was part of her narrative. It frustrated me because how dare you put anyone in that position? But then ultimately she was a child at, at that stage. At this point, she's a young adult, but just adding to just that level of trauma in her, from her point of view, you know, I, I destroyed my mom by telling her like her husband wasn't coming back and he's right over there. If you want to go see him before, you know, they, you know, take him away and things of that nature and just how horrible that is. So it's just really frustrating just hearing you and Daisy and just even, you know, just everyone share their stories because I, my parents both speak English and Spanish. So it's just a matter of turning it on and off. And I, I've never had to experience that firsthand, but even hearing from my clients, it's upsetting to me. And I didn't even go through it. The amount of just anger that comes up of is just initially like, how dare you do that? You're a professional, like, how dare you? You know that, you know better than that. But again, it, like you're saying, there's a level of convenience. There's a level of just automatic because my mom shared that, that people would talk about my grandfather and just like, oh, they must be on welfare. And just making these comments because he didn't speak Spanish and my not knowing my mom knew English, again, her being super outspoken, would have to defend her family of like, one, you're rude for talking about someone and you know they don't know what you're hearing. But secondly, you're making assumptions because they don't know the language as if they're just automatically these people that just take and take and take from the system. We just took a break to do some breathing because it, it got a little heavy and overwhelming. You know, the translating work and the interpreting work, especially for children of immigrants, you know, goes so much further than the language, you know, it creates relationship, it creates sometimes burdens and I think I could want to 
transition to kind of a lighter topic, which is how we show affection. Because I think there's a lot of similarities in Latinx and Asian cultures in how when you tell your kids you love them by not telling your kids you love them, maybe. <laughs> so I wanted to hear like how y'all express love in your family. Well, I think food is big that I notice in both my husband's family and mine, just like cooking represents, I love you. I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I hurt you, everything. <laughs> I agree. I think there's, I just recently, someone had put words to this and it made so much sense that when they cook, they cook in a good mood and they put so much passion in their food because it tastes different. They, they know when they truly put their all in their meal as opposed to, okay, we just have to get this done because we have soccer practice. And it was so brilliant that a dad told me this recently because I, I knew I felt it, but I've never heard it in words because that's, I could try and make the same thing my grandmother did growing up and it's not the same, but I will say food and I mean, my family's a hugger and this is with anyone. If you're somebody new, they're just like, okay, come here and hug. I mean, right now it's the pandemic, so it's a little different, but before it was, nope, you're family now, you're family now, which I appreciated because I've brought friends and, and others over who maybe they just grew up a little differently and that's okay. And then after they're just overwhelmed, I'm like, this is how we are. I told you, I gave a disclaimer. This is how we are. That's so funny that you guys mentioned like food because I always, I single-handedly blame my dad for my hot Cheetos addiction because whenever we would be happy or whatever, anything, right? They sell them at the gas station. So it's pretty accessible. He would always buy us a bag of hot Cheetos each. So growing up, there was three of us. Now I have like a little brother who's like 15, I think. It's a little different for him. But for us, it was always hot Cheetos. Like anything, my dad would buy us hot Cheetos. It's like a staple like childhood memory of mine um and so till this day I eat hot Cheetos I think about my dad and I think that is so true though right like putting love in food like you can definitely tell a big difference like let me tell you my cooking versus my grandma's cooking my grandma puts a lot of love in her food because her food is so good and it's even about like food being able to bring people together um it, food is a way of celebrating. It's a way of like calling in your neighbor and being like, hey, we have leftovers or come eat dinner with us. Um, my mom is super, super like, I don't know what the right word is, maybe proud um, of her cooking. She's a really good cook. And so she always will, you know, invite my husband over to like cook meals with her because my husband loves to cook and the food is just so good. I'm like, how come mine doesn't turn out that way when I cook with you, mom? And she's like, because you don't put love in the food and your husband does. I'm like, ouch, <laughs> but maybe it's true. I don't like cooking. So it makes sense. And then in terms of like affection, Jack, when you said, um, you know, how do we say like, I love you? Maybe it's not by saying that in my family. We definitely never said I love you. It's so awkward. And like, even to have my dad, one time my dad hugged me, I was so, I was like, Whoa, what is that dad? Are you okay? Something wrong. It was so weird. Uh, so we do like a little side hug, like a little tap. Um, and so I relate to that a lot, but I know that a lot of other people from like my culture, Latinx culture, they do hug and they do kiss, but in my family, we don't. So it's just very different. Oh my gosh, I'm just with everybody with the food of, of using food as affection and like I love you and I care about you. So let me feed you and like fatten you up and so you could like roll home, you know. <laughs> um, so my mom is also a really good cook. I'm actually a pretty good cook myself, <laughs> um, but my mom is really good. We don't live very far from each other and so she'll be like, like come over more, I'll feed you. And I'm like... <laughs> mama you don't need to she's like I'll make you food and I'm like you don't have to bribe me you know but I think that's just her way of like being like I want to do things for you and um and I think a lot about in the five love languages like the like acts of service has been huge in my family my dad we hardly ever like say thank you to each other he he was really like a handy person I don't know I think he had a mind of an engineer he would just like be able to think things on solving things like creatively and then I'd be like oh like thank you Appa and then he'll just <laughs> he just grunts and it just like leaves you know <laughs> and that means like 
I love you too. Thank you. You know, or like, you're welcome. You know, but he can't, like, he can't say that. Or like, I have to buy tires. Like he'll financially support me and tires are expensive. So he's like, he's like, I sent you money, you know, on the phone, just click. And I'm like, oh, thanks. Like, in my head, I'm like, love you too, dad. You know? Oh my gosh. I will say, I think that's literally the two sides of my parents. When I fight with my mom after we fight, like we never apologize or anything. My mom will just look at me and be like, so what do you want for dinner? <laughs> and then my dad is basically that, like every time we talk, uh, before we hang up the phone or anything, he's like, you okay? You need money? You need anything? You, are you okay? <laughs> I'm like, no, dad, it's okay. <laughs> Love you. Part of it is that, you know, I noticed for myself and, you know, for my family, like I wanted some other kinds of affection other than just acts of service and like gifts, right? So to practice like words of affirmation, you know, I remember a few years ago, I started saying, I love you to my mom and my dad. And they were so awkward about it. And my dad still is awkward about it. I think he said, he said it back once now and my brother and I both were like <laughs> but every time we say like I love you dad he'll be like okay 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 thank you thank you okay okay bye <laughs> like just shut up yeah please enough <laughs> no not this <laughs> uh, but we are running out of time so I just want to say thank you all for you know taking the time and sharing your stories with us you know, and for anyone listening or watching, I really hope that this resonates and this is helpful. If y'all are looking for any more support or resources, feel free to follow us on our pages. We're on Instagram or on YouTube. You can also go on our website, which is yellowchaircollective.com. And you can find all of us um, on, our ther on the therapist directory there. So yeah, any last words for, from anyone before we kind of close out today? Just want to say thank you all. I love the conversation. I learned so much. I had a lot of fun recording. <laughs> thank you all. This was super special. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. I learned so much and you all are so funny. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to learn more about each other and our cultures and the commonalities and differences. I think it's beautiful. Well, thank you all for being here today. And um, yeah, hopefully this is the first in a series <laughs> and uh, we'll keep them coming. Right. Bye. Bye.